Roswell, the black mailbox, the wow signal, the men in black. For decades, there's been a huge cultural fascination with unidentified flying objects and the nefarious efforts the pesky government will go to to keep that information to itself. And some of you even wanted to raid Area 51 last year. But unlike you posers, there was one man, one hero, who risked it all to find some answers. Gary McKinnon. But before we get into the mad lad, it is, in fact, your boy, Raid Shadow Legends. The hottest game on the Play Store with almost a perfect score, with over 450 champions for you to collect, and my favourite thing to do in the game is still slapping people around in the PvP arena. What makes Raid stand out from other games is the effort they put into its development. Every single champion is fully animated with Raid's own in-house motion capture studio. Each character is rigged to move and behave individually from the way they stand right down to the way they hold their weapons. This is some dedicated investment into the game. Raid is always releasing new updates and in one of their biggest upcoming updates they are releasing the Doom Tower. 120 floors of super hard levels and even harder bosses like the Frost Spider, the Magma Dragon and the Tomb Crab in what will be one of the most challenging game modes. So click my link down below, and if you are a new player, you will get 50,000 silver, 50 gems, an energy refill, one clan boss key, five mystery shards, a one day XP booster, and a free champion, Hexweaver, who is really good for new players. These rewards are only available for the next 30 days and only to new players, and you can find these rewards here in your inbox. Click the link so that I can buy a camera tripod that's not meant for children. Gary McKinnon was born on the 10th of February 1966 in Glasgow. At the age of six, his parents separated and he moved to London with his mum and stepdad, the latter of whom Gary really looked up to. Gary's stepdad lived in Bonnybridge near Falkirk, which has a reputation among UFO enthusiasts. It's pretty much Scotland's Roswell because of the 300 reported UFO sightings that occur there every year. This caught young Gary's attention and his mind was blown when his stepdad told him about a dream he had where he was walking around the village seeing huge ships in the sky. Gary quickly became obsessed and started reading all of the sci-fi he could get his hands on and when he was 15, he joined the British UFO Research Association, which was a group of about 300 people across the country that were dedicated to trying to make sense of all these UFO sightings. Over time, Gary really started to hope that there was something out there, that there could be an advanced alien civilization watching and waiting for us to find them. This hope stayed in the back of Gary's mind for a long time, and he honed his talents for working with computers after he dropped out of high school. And he then found work as a freelancer on a series of tech support jobs. But then Gary read a book by the Disclosure Project who advocate for disclosing classified UFO information and his obsession deepened. This book contained over 400 testimonies from air traffic controllers and military personnel, and they all mentioned the existence of anti-gravity technology. And one such account by a photographic expert at NASA said that they regularly airbrush UFOs out of satellite images in Johnson Space Center. This was enough to convince Gary that these accounts were genuine. 
By this point, Gary's friends at the UFO Research Association weren't proactive enough for his liking. They were too focused on just believing in UFOs instead of actually trying to find evidence. So in 1995, Gary decided to take initiative. He was going to find the evidence. So Gary installed a program on his computer that searched for other computers that ran Windows and he found administrator usernames without passwords. He knew that he couldn't just break straight into Area 51's computers, so he decided to start small and hone his talents. But after a while, he managed to hack into a few pretty big places, like Oxford University's network. After that point, Gary decided that he was ready to join the big leagues. Armed with his new skills and his passion for the truth, Gary sat down at his computer in his girlfriend's aunt's house. He lit up a joint, cracked open a cold one, and fired up his 56k dial-up modem. And he decided to see if the truth really was out there. See if anybody's wondering why uh, the lighting just randomly changes partway through my videos. It's because I set the lights in stupid places and then they, they're able to beam directly into my eyeballs and fry my brain. And then I start getting a headache halfway through filming. So then I move the lights around. I do it almost every time. I just, I just, I don't learn. Gary actually managed to break into very many systems. He had administrator level remote access to computers in the highest levels of the US government and military. He hit the jackpot. He then just casually logs into NASA's servers and he found exactly what he was looking for. He found very high res images stored in folders labelled filtered and unfiltered or processed and unprocessed. His dial-up connection didn't do him any favours though, these were very large images, so downloading just one photo took ages, but eventually he managed to get a glimpse of a silver oblong object with spheres on each side of it, and it had no seams or rivets holding it together. This object was not man-made, and it looked an awful lot like these famous Tic Tacs that we keep hearing about. But, unfortunately, before Gary could get a further look at the rest of E.T.'s OnlyFans, a sysadmin at NASA noticed him in the system, and he was quickly disconnected. Despite not getting to see as much as he wanted, this was like Christmas come early for Gary, and from this point onwards, he was hooked. He went on to spend most nights for the next seven years snooping around NASA's computers, smoking weed, and freaking out scientists who were wondering why the cursor was moving on their screen when they weren't even touching the mouse. The scientists would then report this to the admins, and Gary would get booted out of the system. Then, Gary stumbled onto something huge. He managed to find Excel spreadsheets labelled non-terrestrial officers, which contained the names and ranks of US Air Force personnel who were not registered anywhere, as far as Gary could tell. He also found information about ship-to-ship -ship transfers, but the names of these 8 to 10 ships also were not registered anywhere. These were obviously top secret officials and vessels that were involved in black ops operations, which is why their identities were top secret. But unfortunately, Gary was so high when he discovered this information that he doesn't remember any of the names. And just like most connoisseurs of the internet, Gary, just like the rest of us, enjoyed partaking in a bit of trolling. And would sometimes leave messages on people's screens in the form of text files, reading stuff like, Your security is crap, and I am solo, I will continue to disrupt at the highest levels. But, to be completely fair, their security was crap. 
Whenever Gary carried out a network status command, it revealed that Gary was never browsing alone. Hackers from all over the world in countries like Denmark, Italy, Germany, Turkey, Thailand, they were all connected to the machines with him. Though Gary never interacted with any of them. And to this day, Gary has absolutely no idea who they were. Over time, hacking into the US government became more than a UFO search for Gary. He became addicted to the thrill of it, and it almost became like a game to him. So he started looking to break through more and more complex security. And after he got a tip from a friend, Gary hacked into a Pentagon-funded advanced research agency and found evidence that they were inventing a robot soldier that could go upstairs, find bombs, and do a bunch of other dangerous stuff without using real people. Gary also found some really bad Special Forces training videos that looked like fight scenes from the Adam West Batman series. Yes, apparently even the US military isn't immune from the cringe that is 90s corporate training videos. Hacking had really taken over Gary's life and it got to the point where he quit his job as a systems admin and his girlfriend broke up with him in the year 2000. But they still lived together in her aunt's house where Gary would be hacking away and reading up on all of the latest court martial reports coming out of all of the military bases with the word fort in the name. Gary continued to do this and live at her aunt's even after she got a new boyfriend. I don't know if that counts as being cucked or not. But, in March 2002, the inevitable finally happened. Gary never covered his tracks very well, and the program that he used to carry out his adventures was traced back to his own email address. After a night of gaming and light hacking, Gary was awoken from an hour of sleep by a member of the high-tech crime unit standing at the foot of his bed. Gary and his ex-girlfriend were arrested and all of the computers in the house were taken. After spending a night in the police station, Gary was relieved to hear that he would be charged under the Computer Misuse Act, which would only have given him six months of community service. But Gary's relief didn't last long as the United States moved to extradite him in 2005. They accused him of hacking into 97 US military and NASA computers between February 2001 and March 2002, and causing $700,000 worth of damage to the Army's Washington DC network by crashing it for 24 hours by deleting critical files and user accounts not long after 9-11 happened. Gary denied this, but he did admit that he might have deleted a few files by accident. The Americans gave Gary a very sketchy offer of clemency that they refused to offer in writing. They basically said, cover the cost of extradition and play ball, and we'll only give you three to four years. Sensing shenanigans and wanting to have his day in court, Gary declined the offer despite the advice of his lawyer, and Gary instead made a big-brained counter-offer. Gary said to the United States, If you try to throw the book at me, I will go public with everything that I found. I know these documents are sensitive, but I am perfectly willing to give back to you your sensitive shit, you know, at a, at a time of your choosing. So America went, okay, and threw the book at him. Gary was suddenly facing a 70-year sentence in an American prison and a long and hard fight against extradition. News of Gary's ordeal spread quickly through the media and the internet and he gained a lot of supporters who believed that he was being treated too harshly and support for him grew even more after an ITV interview that he did in 2008. 
a woman with Asperger's and a number of mental health professionals that were watching the interview gave Gary's lawyers the heads up about their suspicion that Gary might have Asperger's. Considering what he was going through already, a trip to the shrink was the last thing that Gary wanted and you can't really blame him for being reluctant. But eventually, he underwent a three-hour examination with some top psychiatrists and received a diagnosis. Gary did in fact have Asperger's. Now, you would think that this would be a massive game changer. After all, support for Gary exploded after this discovery. It even led to a massive Free Gary campaign. And there was even a song written by David Gilmore of Pink Floyd, Chrissy Hind and Bob Geldof, which featured Gary himself. The diagnosis also explained all of his obsessive tendencies and naivety that led him to doing what he did, as well as his crippling hatred of public transport that stemmed from childhood. Surely this would have been the break that Gary desperately needed, but unfortunately the Department of Justice simply did not care. They didn't ease up on their extradition efforts at all, and Gary continued to lose appeal after appeal to the House of Lords, the European Court of Human Rights, and the High Court. Can relate. Over the next four years, the sheer length and stress of this ordeal, the effect of it on his friends and family, and the thought of spending the rest of his life in a foreign prison, took a very heavy toll on Gary, and it left him in a very, very dark place. But as he was at his lowest point, when he thought his life was over, an unexpected hero suddenly emerged onto the scene on the 16th of October, 2012. Yes, to Theresa May. Theresa May. Theresa May swooped in and used her powers as Home Secretary to block Gary's extradition. She argued that because of Gary's Asperger's and his severe depression, that if he was extradited, there would be a very high risk of suicide. So to extradite him would be a violation of Gary's human rights. And it worked. After a decade, the nightmare finally ended. And further good news came two months later when it was announced that Gary would not even be prosecuted in the United Kingdom. <laughs> Charges against him were dropped. Gary was finally a free man. However, the fact that, apart from all the stress, Gary got off pretty much scot-free leaves me wondering... Because a lot of people know what governments sometimes do when they arrest hackers. Instead of wasting their talents by throwing them in prison, governments instead seek to utilise these talents. You know, a sort of, so here's the deal, buddy. You can either do a 20 stretch for your crimes, or you can come and work for us and we can make all of this go away. That is a thing. That is a thing that a lot of intelligence agencies do. They aren't trying to catch hackers for the purpose of justice. They are trying to catch them because they're hiring. So is that what happened to Gary? Well, we don't know. So where is Gary now? He obviously can't leave the UK because of the extradition warrant. But there are no restrictions on his ability to use computers, which means that he is free to do what he does best for a living. He founded a company called Small SEO in 2014, where he helps small businesses optimise their search engine rankings and increase their web traffic. And after everything that Gary went through, it's nice to know that he's actually doing pretty well for himself now. So, was it all worth it? Thanks to Gary's efforts, has the alien conspiracy finally been unravelled? Well, probably not. Remember when I says that Gary used to smoke a lot of weed while he was hacking? 
Well, Gary himself has actually admitted that on many of the occasions, he was actually too high to remember any of the information that he found, and that he may have misinterpreted some parts. The weed giveth, the weed taketh away. The UFO that he found in that unaltered picture, probably just a satellite. The spreadsheets of non-terrestrial officers, probably just some strategy exercise or war game. The Department of Justice itself even announced that the information that Gary downloaded wasn't actually classified. It wasn't even important. It was nothing. So it's safe to say that in the end, Gary didn't really find anything substantial. But, if that really was the case, then why were you trying to give him a 70 year sentence and fighting for his extradition for 10 whole years after he threatened to go public with it? Not important. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody says, subscribe!